Okay. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much for following uh, till the end. So today's last lecture. I uh, remind you that there's a recollection, but we don't do any new material in the living production. That's the whole point of a recollection. So today's, yeah, so the last lecture. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for existing. Thank you so much for watching the videos. Um, okay. So what we have seen last time, I will come back to that um, later until we are done with today's material. And I will kind of make a little wrap up um, what, what you have seen about knots. But essentially what it was was kind of an invariant, um, kind of an, a sequence of invariants, a sequence of yes and no's associated to a, to a knot. This was this p colorability. And essentially it boiled down to a certain type of equation. And whenever you see an equation, um, a linear type of equation, you should put it into a matrix. And whenever you see a matrix, you should compute its determinant. And that's essentially what we did up to some little technicalities here and there. Fine. And the determinant is an invariant of the knot, and it tells you everything you want to know about the colorability of the knot. Right? So if, if, if P divides, it, it's P colorable if and, if, if and only if P divides uh, the determinant. OK. And today I would like to touch upon uh, the final topic, which is kind of coming back to surfaces, something uh, really cute actually, and really, really powerful. So we get a really good statement in this case um, where we kind of combine knots and surfaces, right? We tried that several times. Combining different ideas is always some kind of good. It's always kind of good. And this time we combine what we've learned about surfaces with kind of knots. Knots are more difficult than surfaces, so surfaces should tell us something about knots and not the other way around. And that's exactly what we'll do. And the surfaces we look at, they are named after uh, a mathematician called Seifert, and they're called Seifert surfaces. Okay. And it's really just this idea that you have a knot, um, that you just have a surface. A knot is just S1, right? Remember, a knot is just a fancy embedding of S1. So just really just a circle, and it sits somewhere crazy, somehow crazy in, in R3. Um, so we could ask, is there a surface with that boundary? And is there some kind of surface that bounds the knot. And because projective planes and friends are complicated, I want it to be an oriented surface. And every surface that does that job, such as the boundary is precisely the knot, that's called a Seifert surface. So the easy example you should have in mind all the time is exactly if I draw uh, the unknot. So here's my unknot. Um, what is the Seifert surface? Well, it's just filling this thing with a disk. Right, so the Seifert surface in this case is a disk. Yeah. And if you have a more crazy knot, well, it's not quite clear what's supposed to happen. But we'll see actually that you get a, a, a really fantastic answer. Okay, hopefully the question is reasonably clear. You have a knot, it sits somewhere in space, and now you're looking kind of for a, a surface that fills in the space, if you want. And we call those guys Seifert surfaces, kind of kicking out Mobius strips and projective planes and all that crazy stuff. We're just interested in orientable surfaces. OK. And you think they're really cute? Um, theorem is not quite clear. If you just think about the definition, why, if you have a really, really complicated knot, like that sits somewhere crazy in, in space, uh, why on earth is there any surface at all that bounds the knot? Yeah. But every nerve ha knot has a Seifert surface. And I show you. Um, a proof, we see kind of several proofs of this fact. It's kind of, it's kind of really amazing. Those, those surfaces are kind of really amazing. They come up from uh, very different perspectives. Right? But just out of, the, out, of, out of the definition, it's not so clear. I mean, I, I was able to draw it for the unknot, but the unknot is also not a very complicated knot, I guess. So what about a really difficult knot? What can we actually do? Um, well, we'll see. But note that I'm just asking for a surface. There could be like a trillion of them. Uh, let's just go back to our unknot. Here's our unknot. Very good. And here's a surface. Yeah. But I could also just attach a stupid handle here, and I get a different surface, which is also bounding the knot. Right? So there's usually, if there's one, there are just a lot of them. Um, so they're usually not unique. So what we will do, so whenever I have something that is not unique, you should kind of try to pick out to kind of make it unique. So we'll kind of look at the minimal one, if you want. You'll see that in a sec. Right? I could just attach more and more handles here. I could put another handle here. 
to the surface or whatever, you, you get the point, right? So it's just uh, still bounding, bounding the disk. And the formal proof will be an algorithm that constructs the surface for you, which is kind of really cool. And that algorithm is really important, and it has a name. It's called Seifert's algorithm, again, named after the same mathematician. And yes, it will appear in the exam, in, in case you're wondering. Um, so, but first, giving the real world, I give you the real world proof of this, uh, of this statement. And it's actually extremely amazing. So if you do the following, I will run a video for you. Um, let's see. So you can just build, build the knot. Oh, come on. Not on this screen, on the other screen. You can just build a knot out of, out of wire, for example. And then the Seifert surface is the, is the thing you get if you put it into soap and pull it out, you get a surface which kind of minimizes its area because they kind of want to minimize the tension and you will get those surfaces. So they usually look like this. We'll see them in a second. But you get them if you just put them in soap. So if you put them in, there will be, so yeah, exactly. So if you put them in soap, they come out quite nicely up to some fluctuations because it's real life. And they have a surface bounding the knot. So you build the knot out of wire, and the soap will minimize um, kind of, you, it's really kind of minimized area. So it kind of tries to minimize its area because of tension, and what you get, will get is really beautiful. It's actually a Zypher surface. So here, uh, again, there will be some fluctuations that you can get rid of, but eventually you just get uh, those beautiful surfaces. Absolutely amazing. Okay, they, they, they don't last forever if you really build them uh, out of soap. All right, that was a real world proof why you should believe that those things exist. Right, the, 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 it's kind of really crazy. The surface is like, like a bended disc that bends around a, along the knot, and it kind of minimizes its area if you build it out of soap. I will give you a mass proof later, uh, but for now, I hope this kind of, kind of makes sense what's happening here. Kind of really beautiful. It's really beautiful. So they come up in different areas because kind of this one is the one with the minimal area and soap general, in general will try to minimize its area because try to avoid too much tension um, in the surface. So this was my real world proof, if you want, of uh, the, the theorem. Okay, and, then, and now I'll show you the mass proof. Okay. The real world proof is much better, but eventually we need a mass proof. And the mass proof is essentially an algorithm. And we'll run that algorithm like a million times because it's kind of important. Okay. Okay. So I, I will have a pic I will have like millions of pictures in a second. But they are built out of steps. So the first step is, and you really just need to do that in order to kind of keep track of what you're doing, you just put a traveling orientation on the knot. Just put a little arrow. Um, so let me just do it. So if you have a knot, that's not a very interesting knot, but anyway, you put traveling orientation and you kind of follow that traveling orientation. And you can do whatever you want as orientation. Just fix one, fix the dire direction of travel. Okay. And now you need this because of the following. At each crossing, kind of the crossing ones are the interesting ones, you will now, there will be some orientation now, so there will be some, something like this. Yeah? And you use this to reconnect the strings. Well, there are two options to do this, and the orientation tells you which one to choose. Okay, the orientation tells you to choose the one that is consistent with the orientation. So you have some ingoing, and I have some outgoing, and there's, there are two choices, and it will draw the other one as well. The other choice would have been this one, but this is inconsistent with the orientation, as you will see in a second, so we don't do this one. So the orientation tells you which, which one you, you pick. And locally around each crossing, there will be a unique choice. Just do that one. And just reconnect the strings. Okay. Right. Reconnect them as in this little picture. And then we'll see a picture in a second. Then you get a bunch of circles. Because you get rid of all crossings, you will get a bunch of circles on the knot projection. And you just, I will show you a picture in a second. You just imagine the different circles are being like little platforms. And where you put in a disk, into each platform. So you have a little platform here, you have a little platform here, you put in a little disk into the platform, and then you just need to decide what to do around uh, the places where you had crossings before, 
And what you will do is you will just mimic this picture and you put in a little twist. You'll see that in a second. So you, you put in a little twist. So let me actually do this this way. You put in a little twist, which will do the following. So here was my crossing before. And it will put the green, which is, ups, the ups, uh, which is now on the top of the picture. It will twist it to the bottom and put the bottom one up. So that's what the twist does. Okay, so now here it goes to blue. So blue, blue is on the bottom here, and green is on the bottom here, and the twist kind of exchanges bottom and top. I hope it makes some sense. And then what you get is the Zypher surface. That's it. That was the soap. That's what the soap is doing as well. Um, we will have a look at the soap in a second. If you just look closely at what the soap is doing, you can kind of see those twists here, for example. Right, it's going here, and it pulls this one to the bottom. Let me get rid of the little drawing here. And can you see it? It kind of goes twist like this around. And we just do the same. And here you can see it again. It just twists this guy around. It just goes around and twists the, the, the surface from bottom to top. So it's really just mimicking what the soap does. And yeah, what you get is the Zypher surface. Um, exactly what you do. I have a little picture for you um, now with red and green. I hope that works. So the one of them is red, one of them is green. The red one has green on the bottom, the green one has red on the bottom, and you just twist it so that uh, bottom goes to top. Um, and have a, yeah, whatever, you just pull in this little twist. Okay, and that's, that's it. That's the construction. It's actually not so bad. So um, do I have a nice example? Yeah, okay. So here you have an example. So you have a knot, like the figure eight knot. You orient everything. Well, let's do it. So here, for example, let me try to draw the knot. That will probably horribly fail, but we'll see. That was bad. Ooh, actually worked out. Um, and you put an orientation on it. Yeah, let's do that. Let's put an orientation on the knot. Bash, whatever. And now every crossing, you can now at every crossing decide how to do it. Okay, so we just decided every crossing how to do it. Um, let me just put in the orientations at every crossing. So I go around here, I go around here, I go around here, go around here, come in here, 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 here. Do I miss one? Here and here. And here, right? So at every crossing, you can now de really decide what to do. So let me try to do this. Um, let me just copy this beast, paste it here, uh, get rid of the little decorations. Okay. And now what you do is you kind of. Oop, that was bad. I didn't want stroke out. I want standard. So go back. Whoop, you just get rid of the crossings. Okay, and you redirect according to the orientation. So up here, the redirection tells me to do it like this. Hope that's reasonably clear. Down here, redirection is like this. Redirection is like this. And redirection is like this. Yep, and you get those platform type objects, right? So they're all now kind of little, little circles sitting in the plane, and you draw in, uh, you put in now a disk into everything. So here's a disk, let me do three different disks, because I have three different circles. Here's a disk, and here's a disk, and you glue in those little bends where you had the, uh, the crossings before. And what you get is a Zypher surface. Okay, so let's have a look again uh, that makes sense. So here you have this little disk you glue in. As you can see, this one goes all the way around and ends then at the bottom. You glue in those little um, twists. And you're going to start. I think that's a really fun way to construct the surface somewhat. Uh, let's have a look at the, at the soap again. The soap does exactly that. It has those little platforms. Yeah, and it connects them uh, via twists where the crossings, original crossings of um, the Zypher surface were. Uh, sorry, of the of the not were. Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Okay, very nice. Hopefully it makes some sense. This is Zypher's algorithm. 
Yeah, and you can run it on every node diagram, on every node projection. It's really simple. Just do it as exactly as I did it. Just uh, put the diagram, put orientations on it, erase the crossings, and re re or reconnect according to orientations. And then glue in those little twists. So we get a ciphered surface for every uh, knot. And again, they're not unique, of course. You can just, this is kind of the minimal one you can put in if you want. You could put in a little handle here, but um, yeah. So we just have found one of them. It gives you one that's kind of minimal. It gives you the soap one. The soap, the soap really just wants to be minimal anyway because it wants to minimize any, anything, so it will never put in any stupid handles. And the algorithm uh, does exactly the same. Cool. I hope that makes sense. Orientation circles, orientations, platforms, or circles, whatever you call them, and bands. Yeah. And then, then you're done. Cool. So, well, examples, um, yeah, uh, done. Because there is no crossing, it's just, a, it's just a platform, so you just put in a disk. Fine. Trefoil, the trefoil and the figure eight will do, um, so they, they usually look like this, right? You have those little, those little let's do the trefoil uh, once more. What is a good color? Maybe red. So it goes over, it goes under, it goes over, it goes under, whatever. Something like this. You put in orientations. Okay, wonderful. Going all the way around. And that's already it. You get rid of the crossings. Whoop, whoop, whoop. You reconnect according to orientations. Maybe with blue. Top, 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 top. And there's only one choice. So you get a platform sitting on top of a platform. You glue in the little twists. Uh, what is a good color for twists? Maybe this one here. You glue in the little twists. And what you get is this picture. Does it make sense? You have the platform at the bottom. You have the platform at the top. I will go back to the other one as well. And you have three twists that you glue in. And that's exactly um, the picture you get here. Right? The, the platform at the top, let's say this one. The platform at the bottom, let's say the, the bottom one as the, the big one and you glue in the little twists. And they're kind of, kind of beautiful. So if you do those for bigger type of knots, um, yeah, they get, get really sophisticated and kind of beautiful. You could kind of see how, the, how it's kind of the minimal surface. It's, it really is the minimal surface uh, that bounds um, the knot. Cool. So this one is fun to do. So maybe this one is fun to check yourself. Um, so this one is uh, the knot 7-1 or 5-1 is also fun to do yourself. 5-1 is also fun. Remember that I had a, a, a list of knots somewhere. It's 5-1 it's on that list. Okay. Cool. I hope that makes some sense. It's a kind of a fantastic, it's a kind of a fantastic idea. It's just absolutely fantastic. <laughs> and it produces this beautiful surfaces, those beautiful surfaces, without too much effort. It just you somehow get them quite easily. Okay. We have now surfaces associated to a knot, but maybe we can get a numerical invariant, like a number. Numbers are usually a bit easier to control, and that's exactly what we do, and it's called the genus of a knot. And that number is like super powerful. It eventually knows a lot about the uh, surface itself. All right, let's see how that works. So we have now some surface S associated to our knot. Okay. So we want to cook up a numerical invariant from S. So what do we know about S? Well, S will be something in our standard form. So it will definitely, if you do it in standard form, so S will be some S2, some, some D2s, some number of them. Ah, oh God, too many hash symbols. But anyway, some hash number of Ts, uh, tori, some hash number of P, Okay, whatever, something like that. But we know the following fact. It's orientable by construction because we want that, right? It's by definition, it's orientable. So this guy is, is gone. It bounds the knot. So we know that D is one, actually. And right? there's just one boundary component. So this guy is one. So the only inter the remaining number that we have is this one. And that's essentially what the genus will be. It will be the, the number of tori in the surface. Right, let me do it again. 
This is our standard form. We know S will be in that form. It's orientable, no projective planes. There's just the knot as a boundary, so D is 1. So the only information left are the number of tori. And that's exactly what the genus is. That's annoying. What are you doing? Ooh. It's very rainy outside. All right. All right. So essentially what I just said is it's orientable and has one boundary component. So D is 1 and P is 0. Right. So it's just D squared. It's just 1 D and 1 T. And we know how to compute T because we have the formula for the Euler characteristic. Uh, so it's just 1 minus the Euler characteristic divided by 2 in this case because D is 1 and P is 0. And because that number is essentially our genus. We just minimize the world surface alpha surfaces, right? So we have infinitely many of them. So we need to kind of pick out the minimal one. So we just minimize uh, the tori. And we call that the genus of a knot. So this number is just T. I just write it in terms of the Euler characteristic. Yeah. So the minimum over all alpha surfaces the number of handles, the minimal number of handles you need. There you go. It's called the genus of a knot. For some historical reasons, um, the number of tori is always called the genus. There you go. It's called the genus of a knot. Okay. Um, so let's say the knot is the unknot. What is the genus of the unknot? Well, you could put in a disk. It can't get, can't get lower. T is 0 for the disk. But it can't get smaller, so it is actually 0. hope that makes sense. Right? It can't get smaller than 0. So if you find a disk, then, then you're good. Usually, why this is so difficult is you would need to check that for all diagrams, and you would need to minimize over all diagrams. But if you just find 0, then, then you're good anyway. And it turns out this invariant is like ultra strong. It turns out that the genus is zero if and only if you're not as an unknot. If you can compute um, kind of the genus is not zero, you always know that it's not the unknot, and the unknot is the only one with genus zero. That's not so easy to show, but um, it's a fact. It's true. You can use it. It's absolutely amazing. It's not true for anything we have seen so far. Yeah, the, the, for example, the figure eight knot was not three colorable. So for three colorability, this is not an if and only if. Um, but for the genus, it is. So the genus is like a super strong invariant. The genus is zero if and only if the knot is the unknot. One direction is easy. I just did it upstairs. The other one is, is much trickier. I will not, uh, not do it. But right now, it's really not clear how to compute this funny number. Because you would need to minimize over an infinite set. And that's usually like the, the infinite set of all possible diagrams of the knot or possible projections. And that's like not so easy to do. But I will show you how to do it. So we actually, actually can compute uh, this number, which is like the, the strongest invariant I ever show you. It's like really, really ridiculously strong. But, but right for now, how would you compute it? Right? It's not, not so obvious, because you minimize over. Um, so for each fixed diagram, it's not so difficult. But if you, because of the minimum, it's actually uh, rather tricky. But that's the price you pay. If you have a really strong invariant, maybe they're not so easy to compute. So that's the price you pay. Fine. But let's, let's go for some uh, examples, or uh, sorry, some propositions. So we have a, S is always a Seifert surface. And the small s is the number of Seifert circles, which is just the number of uh, whatever, the number of platforms you see. If you do this, s is 3. Um, here, maybe here was a crossing. Maybe here was a crossing. Maybe here was a crossing, something like that. So s is 3. Uh, maybe here's another crossing. So c is the number of crossings. It's 4 in this example. 
and the genus is always smaller than a very easy number to compute out of the out of this information. You just need to count the number of circles, which is easy. You see red, three red ones here. You need to count the number of crossings, which is also not difficult. You just count the number of crossings, and then the genus is always smaller or equal to uh, this number here: one plus number of crossings minus number of um, circles divided by two. And that's not difficult to compute, right? Counting crossings, counting those circles is not so difficult. Actually, quite a nice result. Yeah, and, and, and essentially, well, I, I, I sketched the proof, but it essentially boils down to um, computing with the order characteristic. Let me, essentially, it boils down to this equation which we had with the order characteristic at one point, and you can compute the order characteristic of E, A, A, and uh, B, where A are the surfaces, uh, the circles, sorry, and B are the, the twists. And you just do it, and you get whatever, S minus C for the Euler characteristic. And if the Euler characteristic is S minus C, and, well, let me go back to the other slide, and the genus is 1 minus the Euler characteristic over 2, we can just put in S minus C, right? And we get uh, 1 plus C minus S over 2. And you're just putting it in. And a genus needs to be smaller than that because we just did it for one diagram, right? If you find one diagram, you minimize over all of them, so the genus needs to be smaller than that number. Hope that makes some sense. So let's do it for uh, two different knots. So the top one, so you just write down the circles. Yeah, so let's, um, well, if, you, if, if we did this here, remember, I don't want to do it again. Um, where was it actually? Here. So you do it, you orient the knot, you put in the circles, and we can then just count on this slide and then double check on the other one. So I definitely see that the number of circles is three. Well, I hope you agree. And the number of crossings was four, right? C is equal to four. Okay. So what is now blah, 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 blah. What is now the result? So the genus is smaller than 4 minus 3 over 2 plus 1. Sorry, 1 plus 4 minus 3 over 2. And if I'm not completely miscounting, then this should be 1. So the genus is smaller than 1. And we know it can't be 0 because this is not the unknown, so it actually is 1 in this case. Um, similarly, if you do it for this guy, let's just try. So if you do it, well, what, what you will see here is that S is, well, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one. So I count five. And the number of crossings is, well, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one. So I count one, two, three, four, five, six. Very good. You feed it in. One plus six minus five over two is one. It's actually really easy to compute. Yeah. So you just do the algorithm, run the algorithm. And then counting number of circles and counting number of uh, crossings is really not difficult. And the formula itself is, is honestly also not very difficult, obviously. So it's actually pretty cool. OK, doesn't make some sense. So you just run this algorithm, and you get the bound for the genus, which is the kind of the number we are really interested in, because it's like really, really ridiculously powerful. The bad news is actually, um, it actually might happen that this th this might might happen because essentially you only we are only computing it for one diagram, but you minimize over all of them. So if you pick a wrong diagram, uh, you will, you will get a, a too big number. That's, that's kind of what makes the genus a little bit tricky. So it's an extremely strong invariance. So the first thing you should try is if there's a question. Is this not the unknot? Maybe you could compute the genus, because if the genus is not zero, it's not the unknot, and you're done. Yeah? But it's a bit tricky to handle sometimes. But turns out that for alternating knots, this number is always, so for an alternating projection, this number is always spot on. Yeah? So how do you check whether an alternating knot is the unknot? Well, you just compute this number, and if it's not zero, you're done. 
Yeah. So how can we check that a uh, knot like this is not the unknot? And also, well, let's start with the easier one. A knot like this is not the unknot. Well, it goes over, under, over, under, over. So it's alternating, over, under, over, under. Bridge tunnel, bridge tunnel. You run the algorithm, which is not difficult. You get number one. And now we actually know, because it's alternating, this is an equality. So it can't be the unknot, because the unknot always has, this is the only knot with gene is zero. Similarly, for the bottom one, it goes under, over, under, whatever. It's alternating. So the genus is actually one. So the bottom knot is not the unknot. So this is like a really powerful way to prove that something is the unknot. The algorithm itself is not difficult. You don't need to compute matrices or determinants or something like that. You just need to draw a few circles. And for an alternating knot, you will, you will be guaranteed to get the correct answer. Yeah? So whether it is the unknot or not, you will be guaranteed to get the correct answer. And this is just this is just really really good, right? That's pretty pretty amazing. The proof is like really difficult, so let's let's not worry about it. Um, but yeah, this is a really fantastic statement if you just think about how difficult knots are, and you can always tell them apart from the unknot as soon as they're alternating. Right? The word here in green is very very important. But just by just running this algorithm, which I say again, as a name, it's called Seifert's algorithm, so it clearly will show up uh, somewhere, <laughs> uh, maybe on the exam. Okay. Let me show you a little bit more about this. Um, it also behaves nicely with the hash sum. Uh, so the hash, the genus of the, the, of the hash is the sum of the genuses. So the genus of K hash L is the sum of the uh, geniuses, so you can again also for, for, for not set up kind of products on the hash, you can easily compute geniuses, but just essentially you only need to know it for the prime knots, and then you can just run it over the prime knots. And this, as usual, with um, so you can always just say, okay, if you have a knot here, whoop, and if this is K, and if you have a knot here, whoop, 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 this is L. Um, then the, the sum of the genuses will certainly do because you get some surface here and some surface here, and they're just boringly connected in the middle. And the tricky, word, the tricky part is again to show that this is actually an equality, which is true, but like tricky, so I'm not going to, to do it. Uh, but this is true, so you can actually use this fact. It's kind of really nice, right? So uh, why is this nice? Well, genus is strong, and now if you have a knot in prime factorization, you want to know the genus, you can just do it per factor, and you just get the correct answer. Okay. Oh yeah, um, this the theorem. The, 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 the theorem actually gives another proof. Um, we, we did that for. Well, let's also do it again for the trefoil knot. So it goes over, it goes under, it goes over, it goes under, it goes over, it goes under. If you do it, what you get is that there's a circle in a circle. Yeah, if you run the algorithm, I, I did that before. I'm too lazy to do it now. So you get a circle in a circle. So you get C is uh, three, three crossings. S is two. You run whatever our little one uh, plus C minus S over two should be hopefully one. Let's see, uh, one plus three. Minus two over two, that looks good. It's one, it's an alternating knot, that's a genus, it's not the R knot, done. Okay. No, no trouble in at all, just, just do it. So let's say, this is kind of a fun thing. So let's say um, we could use the genus to do it, I just, I just put it up. It won't play any role, but I think it's fun. So let's say you have two knots, um, and they're not the unknot. So the unknot is a unit under our multiplication operation. Um, then k cannot be a hash sum of itself with something else, because the genus needs to go up. Yeah. So that can't happen. Again, this is not completely obvious if you just think about what the hash sum does, but it actually uh, can't happen. Okay, so let's go back to our list of knots, which is 
Ah, maybe I just do it this way. Uh, where was our list of nodes? Mm. List of prime nodes somewhere, hopefully, maybe. Ah, there you go. Too many slides. There we go. Um, if you look at the list of small prime nodes, most of them are actually alternating. So you can just write down the genus and you can just do it. Or you can ask a machine to do it. Not so difficult. And you will see that all of these are different, actually. All of these are not the unknot. So the genus should be strong enough to distinguish um, all of the alternating knots here among those uh, from the non-alternating ones. So let me do one more for you. So this one is fun to do. Let me just do it, 5-1. Um, let me just try to find some space somewhere. This looks good, so let's do it here. Okay, 5-1. Ooh, should go. Uh, can I do 5-1 over? Okay, let, let's go back. Let's, let's do it on, ah, here you go. Here we have it, okay, this one. Okay, so if you do this, so let's just uh, put orientations on the knot. So it goes like, it always goes like this. This one is easy. It goes like this, it goes like this, it goes like this. Okay, so what is the resolution of this beast? Uh, so the, 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 what are the Seifert circles? Well, it always goes like this. So what you do is it will end up to be a circle in a circle. I hope that's reasonably clear because here you do this one, here you do this one, here you do this one, this one, and this one. So it will be a circle in a circle. Uh, so two, huh? so these guys have usually a, a very, very large, uh, so the number of circles is two. These guys have usually a very, very large genus. Number of crossings of five, one is, well, it's five, one. So it's hopefully it's five. Okay, five. And then remember that we have the one minus, sorry, one plus C minus S over two. So one plus uh, C is six minus two is 4 over 2 is 2. So the genus of this knot is 2. So you just have proof that this one is not uh, the unknot, and you just have proof that this one is not the trifoil, for example. And similarly, if you would do, uh, where's my little list again? Oh, God, uh, too many. 7-1. Seven 7-1 one. Seven one looks very similar, as you can see. It, it just has more crossings. Um, if you do 7 1, we can also do it just here. It just gives exactly the same, maybe here. So if you do 7 1, then you end up with a circle in a circle again. Just have a look at the picture again. If you just do it for those guys, yeah, for those guys, you just do it. These are, these are torus knots, by the way. If you just do it, uh, now you have 7, and you will resolve exactly in the same way. You get a circle in a circle. Where's my 7? So always S is 2. For all of knots, knots that look like, like 5, 1, 7, 1, they just go around in a circle. You always do this. You always get S equals 2. But you get more and more crossings. So it's crossing is 7 now because it's 7, 1. So if you run it now, we have 1 plus 7 is 8. Minus 2 is 6 over 2. So the genus of this beast will be 3. Okay. And similarly, you can uh, do more and more of those knots. Good. Let's go back to, that takes too long. Let's go back to somewhere at the end, wherever we were. OK. So turns out that this is my last slide, I guess. No, there's one more slide. Very good. Turns out this is almost my last slide. Um, so what we have seen is, OK, for knots, knots are more difficult than surfaces. It's kind of the optimal invariant we can cook up uh, in this lecture is a genus. The genus is really, really, really simple. I, ho I hope that's clear. I hope you do it once yourself. It's really simple. You just compute um, kind of the random Seifert algorithm, compute the number of circles, compute the number of crossings, and you just do the, run the formula. Uh, but we can't distinguish those two. Uh, we still can't, because let's just do it. So let's say we do the genus. So they're both, they both have the same coloring. We can just see that. Um, they both have the same genus, so let's just do it. So if you orient the knot, uh, again, let's just orient it to whatever. Um, you can't really see the difference between 
the crossings, whether they go over or under. So the only difference here, maybe I should stress that, if you can't see that, is that here and here they are swapped. One of them goes over, under, over, under, the other one goes under, over, under, over. Okay. okay. And then you just put in the orientations, but you can't see uh, the crossings anyway. So in both cases, you just get a circle in a circle, a circle in a circle, and then you run the algorithm, and it gives you G is 1 for one of them, and it gives you G is 1 for the other one as well. So we can't distinguish them using the genus. We cannot distinguish them using any type of coloring. Again, no matter, they're too symmetric, right? It's just the coloring for one will be the coloring for the other, essentially. Um, so just some of mirrored. So we, we somehow can't do that. And a whole part of knot theory is, the, the whole point of knot theory, the modern version of knot theory is, that you will always find some knot, you will try to cook up some invariant, like the genus or the coloring, or whatever, you will always find some knot that you can't distinguish. So you somehow always need to build more, um, more kind of invariants. So that's what, what knot theory is essentially all about, trying to play this game, which I kind of, kind of feel is like very, very funny. So you just look at your shoelaces, essentially, how they knot themselves in space, and it turns out that this is essentially an impossible problem in general, and you can only do uh, so much, and we just did we had two invariants, the coloring invariant, which is computable by a determinant, um, and this one, which is computable just by drawing circles. So I pref certainly prefer this one. Okay, but you can't do everything. Um, we are already at the end of the lecture anyway. And on, um, just to be sure here, this is how the exam looked like. There will be topic one, there will be topic two, there will be topic three, and they essentially spread one third, one third, one third. So in case you're wondering, um, and we will go to the recollection on, uh, what is it, on, on Thursday. So I will just go to the recollection and kind of stress a little bit what was interesting. So graphs is essentially a way to model the brain. Uh, surfaces is a way to model the universe. If you want to think of the universe as a kind of a next level of surface, and you would ask the question, what is actually the standard form of the universe? Not so easy. And not is my picture of DNA, my picture of the knotting of life. Okay, thank you so much uh, for coming.